Um, Harry, can you tell us who um, Dr. Richard Harris was before the whole Tyve cave incident? Uh, well, I was just minding my own business, actually. I was just uh, carrying on with life as a, as a, a doctor and um, working uh, half-time at the ambulance service with uh, MedStar, the retrieval service, and also in private practice with my anaesthetics and uh, following my passion of a lifetime of scuba diving and, in particular, cave diving. So, yeah, I was just... Uh, Going about just my a job. regular guy, just like doing oh, his water sports. Exactly. I don't think you were that regular because I don't think people came to us looking for assistance in this big rescue. So you mustn't have been too regular. But I want to ask you, how did you become involved in the rescue that we all saw unfold in media everywhere? Oh, well, I have had a long uh, association with volunteer cave rescue in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, made a lot of connections, I guess, around the world through cave diving and through that rescue community. So when the tyre rescue kicked off, then uh, I was called by one of the British divers over there who um, rang up and asked me if we could uh, come over and give them a hand. Obviously, everybody in this room and everyone in Australia and the world is proud of you, but tell us about you know, how your family reacted to the whole thing. They must have been so proud of you. Uh, absolutely. And look, I, I was really proud and privileged to be part of the rescue. I mean, it was an amazing outcome and um, it's changed my life, uh, that's for sure. Nothing's been the same really since. Um, so, yeah, I think they're equally equally proud. Have you been out of process the whole situation? Is it? Yeah, I have. Um, it's taken a few months because we weren't really aware of the size of the global story while we were there in Thailand. We were just really going about our, our business, doing our job. And uh, like everyone who is involved in the emergency services, um, you know, that's just what you do. You, you go out of your way to help people in strife. And it wasn't really till we came home that we realised, you know, the size of the story and um, saw my photo on the front page of the advertiser. It's a bit special. Did you get a few copies of the advertiser Got a that of day? Yep. <laughs> you are an incredible man. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. on Thank stage you. this afternoon. Round of applause. Round of applause. I've got so many questions, but we don't have enough time. Now, I would like to ask now, Aledi, what are some of the barriers you have encountered as a young woman in the AFL? Look, I think that we encounter barriers in all the different aspects of life, and it was just so interesting listening to Dr Michelle before speak about the barriers that she faced being a, a female in, in physics and you know, the challenges we still face today. I think for me, you know, growing up being a football lover, I faced challenges with you no know, change rooms for girls, uniforms that didn't fit. Um, but the barrier that probably still uh, is relevant to most umpires these days is um, probably the spectator and player and coach feedback we get at times. And I think that can be significant for some people in terms of putting them off what the sport is that I think is, is umpiring. And so I think it's really important for, for us to remember that they're, they're people too and they're individuals. And so for me in, in this aspect of being able to sit up here and talk about umpiring as a pathway and say that they're people too and they're out there to do their best. And so if we can encourage them rather than discourage them, that's going to be really important for their longevity as well. How does it make you feel when you see all these, like a lot of people in this room might have young daughters or granddaughters and you see them wanting to join the AFL teams. How does that make you feel? It's just so exciting. I think now we're so lucky that we live in a world where we see female role models in, in all aspects of life. We have the AFLW now, which has a pathway for playing for those girls. Chelsea, Sally are goal umpires in the AFL, myself as a field umpire. There's now roles for everyone in all different aspects of the AFL. And that's really important because it has been a male-dominated sport for such a long period of time. And if we can crack into that environment, we can do anything. Any advice for some young girls who want to get into it? What would you say your top three tips would be? I think if you're passionate about footy, give it a go. Um, just as we heard before, it doesn't matter what the area is. If that's something you like, give it a go. Stick at it. You're going to face hurdles along the way. If you have the right support, your family, your friends in my case, fellow umpires and coaches, you have that support behind you, you can achieve anything. I think the only limits we have are the ones we place on ourselves. Eleni, round of applause. Round Beautiful of applause. Girl. Very well said. Thank you so much. You're an inspiration. Hello, Reginald. Hi. Now, you have been a lifelong advocate for your community. What have been some of your driving forces? Uh, the what has been some of the things that have made you do what you've done and brought you to where you are today? There were so many, there were so many things and, and as I journeyed down life's road and I, I look back, it's always the best to start at the beginning 
Uh, and I think that journey started back in the end of the 18th century when uh, a gentleman by the name of John Warren, who took up a bit of land on, on the western shores of Lake Eyre, uh, 500 square kilometres of land. And uh, that was within our language speaking, the Arabana people's traditional lands. So um, he uh, set up a working relationship with, with, with the, the Arabana people, giving them employment and giving them protection and creating respect and trust in that. So they worked there. So that bit of property that he bought, 500 square miles, was to end up being Anna Creek Station, now the largest cattle station in the, in the world. So, uh, and it, it went further than that because his son, Francis Dunbar Warren, took up with me grandmother who was a full blood Aborigine and they had seven children. So uh, having a family, so he had to look for a property that he had to set up for his family in there. So w what he did, he moved down, down south of uh, the lake and Anna Creek Station and he took up Finnish Springs parcel property. And he negotiated uh, with departments and that the government at the time to set up a, a, a services that we needed, the educating and, and schools and health and all that sort of stuff and employment and that. So we, we were giving, giving an education in our traditional, tra traditional uh, we kept our traditional cultural activities and that and learning, and we also was le learnt the Western ways of reading and writing in that and creating employment and that. So, uh, and one of the main things was, to me was that looking after and protecting that, that uh, heritage and that cultural thing and the history that, that these, these gentlemen have created in that. So, so we've continued to be able to do that. And, and uh, we, today we still are doing that, uh, carrying out. And, and, and I think we extended that further because we do tours and that. And it's a cross-cultural tour where you take people out and it's on hand learning and learning about the, the environment, learning about the differences and values of culture and sharing that. And, and at the same time, we're saying this, we need to come together as one down the track because we, we're both sharing the land, we're both sharing the, sharing the, the, the culture of change and that. And so that uh, it, it many, there were many obstacles along the way, but, but we've done that and so... Uh, I think is understanding the, uh, the differences of, of cultural values and that, and accepting that, and with accepting that, uh, uh, and then you'd learn to respect, and in within with, within that you you actually build a trust. So the together, without the trust and respect, uh, there's always been that that uh, that uh, animosity or whatever it is between people. But working together has, and, and we've, we've done that over the last 20 years and we've proven that it, it, it's a success and that can happen. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. A round of applause for Reginald Dodd. Thank you. There's so much passion on this stage right now. Um, now we're going to go to Megan. Your work with organ donation and tissue donation and promoting it is incredible. Can you share with us your personal story on Transpire? Uh, yes. So... Um, at the age of about eight, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, at the age of about 26, I had some complications with my eyes. Uh, I was told if I didn't go through with some different surgeries that in 15, time, 15 years' time, I would be legally blind. So no one wants to be legally blind at 27. So went through the surgeries. There was a couple of mishaps. And within three days, 14 eye surgeries, I was deemed legally blind. About three months later, my kidney, I was born with one, started to fail. So within three and a half months, I was on dialysis, waiting for a transplant, a double, so a kidney pancreas transplant. And when I went through all this, um, I held on to hope. Hope is stronger than fear. So this is where I was at. I received a transplant. Since then, I've had three cancer diagnoses now. So I go into surgery in February this year. Um, but this is why Dr. Richard Harris has to help me on stage. I keep him in business, being an ethicist for the last 12 months. So um, I'm very fortunate that to still be here. And as Australians, we're very resilient. Our history shows that we get knocked down, we get back up over and over again. And I found that through this journey and meeting transplant recipients and donor families, they were, some of them were struggling to get back up on their feet. So we set up the Herd of Hope to give them a hand and help them back up. 
I'm very fortunate that in that period I met my husband about a month after my transplant. The argument is still out there that who was more desperate, him or I. He is eight years older than me. I have sent his hair grey. Um, we now have two children, so we have Ella and Sam, so a three-year-old and a two-year-old. So I'm very fortunate that my life has had a positive one after receiving this transplant. And I'm very fortunate that the most influential person in my life on a day-to-day -day basis is someone I will never get the opportunity to meet. I don't know their name. I know no details about them, but they're the most influential person in my life, and that's my organ donor, and they're, they're my best mate. Mm. Wow. Thank you on behalf of all of Australia for what you do and using your struggles to help other people is absolutely admirable. So thank you so much. You're incredible. Can I just ask you as well, if people want to um, help with the Herd of Hope, how can they get involved? Oh, we need all the help we can get. Um, I am very fortunate with this award, obviously, um, as a local hero. And you, you look up the definition of hero and it says courage and strength. And you're only ever... As as strong as those people around you and what, you know, I'm legally blind, but what's invisible to my eyes, my heart sees every day and I have a great team around me that on a basis where in March this year I said, let's put a herd of cattle on Bondi Beach. They went, she's bloody mad, but okay. So we're very fortunate, but we rely on mateship. Organ donation is based on mateship. I don't think you can divine it in simpler terms, but we would support any support. We've survived this far We've moved cattle from Alice Springs to Bondi, back to Adelaide, basically with a shake of a hand and a man's word. So please get in contact with us because we, we need to make our projects next year viable, our kids' camps, our letter writing, and we'll see what we can do besides Bondi. We've got a big, um, big bit of competition with our trying to beat that, so thank you. We'd You're love to hear from you. You are amazing. We will all get in contact with you for sure. Just one more question. We're going to go through each of you as well. What, what does it mean to you to be an SA Australian of the Year? Do you want to start, Harry? Sure. Um, well, firstly, extraordinarily proud um, to be honoured by the state that I love so much. Um, I'm very ferociously parochial and... Um, uh, the thing I hate more than anything is someone from a large city telling me that Adelaide is a slow kind of country town and that uh, there's not much going for it. And I sit in the traffic in Melbourne on Friday night and think, oh God, I live in Adelaide. I love it so much. <laughs> Same. Um, Our but, traffic jam um, is 20 minutes. Sorry to my Victorian <laughs> friends. Um, so it, it's just a huge honour. And um, I think Michelle's words have resonated with me quite deeply that she said she wasn't quite sure why she was there and she certainly didn't know what she was going to do with that honour, but I'm certainly starting to um, get some clarity around that. I'd really like to inspire the next generation of explorers, to be honest. I want to get kids to get out and about and get a few grazes on their knees and uh, take a few risks in a, in a carefully managed way. And um, so I'm looking to do some work with Operation Flinders and the Kids Foundation uh, and uh, get out to the schools and uh, try and fire people up and get them out and find their inner explorer. So that's what I'm You're amazing. To do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Eleni, what does being a 2019 Essay Australian of the Year mean to you? I think I can only echo uh, Harry's words in terms of it's just a really proud and humbling feeling. You know, I think the really important thing about these awards is not just the people who are up here on the stage now, but being able to actually listen to and hear all the inspirational stories that are happening in our communities in a diverse range of things. And from my perspective, the more I can encourage people to be involved in refereeing, officiating, umpiring, it's a fantastic pathway to follow where, you know, young children can build skills in resilience, in confidence, in leadership, work ethic, teamwork and communication. It's a great place to be and we get the best seat in the house to see all these great football games. So for me, it's a way to say, let's get involved, whether it's an umpiring or a playing, whatever the capacity is, but no matter what your gender or your background, you're capable of it. And so I'd like to use this platform to really encourage everyone to be involved. Thank, Thank you. you. You're an amazing role model for our girls out there coming up the ranks. And over to you. What does it being an SA Australian of the Year mean to you? It, uh, to me, I look at it and, and, and it's, it's a privilege to be, to be a, a winner of that, that uh, nomination. 
but it, it actually give you give you a, a a put you out on the forefront where people look at you and recognise you, and then and then to me it opens doors to opportunities and that. So one of the things I'm looking at is is becoming a, a public speaker, and we've talked to and there's many things that we can talk about, but our communication is a great thing of bringing people together. So it, it gives me that confidence in myself, even sitting up here in front of the, the lovely audience we have out there, it gives you confidence to say, well, this is what I'm going to do. If we are not talking, if, if, the, if the people out there don't know what my views are or my values are, then, then there's always that, that misconception. But, but talking and, and exchanging uh, different views and different values, and then this is ideal for that. It gives me that, that, that and builds so much confidence in me to, to be able to do that, and I will do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, Megan, what does it mean for you? I think in Australia we're so fortunate to live here that the only reason I am sitting here before you today is because someone said yes to organ donation. Unfortunately, modern medicine hasn't evolved to the point where we're not reliant on someone else passing away to save another one's life. This award means to me that I hope all Australians can recognise the good that can come of organ donation and if it's given by the example of my life where I met my husband, you know, it didn't only just save my life, but it went on to create two wonderful little lives. And I'm so fortunate that those children chose me as their mum. But I think we need to put a positive spin on it and also say that Australia, we're full of hope. We're good at it. We, we're resilient. We get back up after we've been knocked down and we keep going. And we need to start focusing on, on the good that comes of organ and tissue donation in this country. Thank you. Another round of applause for Megan. Does everybody in this room have goosebumps right now? These guys are amazing. Thank you so much for being on stage with us this afternoon. You're incredible, all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Our 2019 SA Australian of the Year recipients, thank you again. One more round of applause.